right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. My name is Dr. Rika Taribio. I'm the Vice President of Enrollment Management here at Pacifica Graduate Institute. And uh, we would like to welcome everyone who's joining us virtually on Zoom. Thank you for joining us here today. And uh, this is a momentous occasion celebrating mental health. And uh, welcome again to our mental health in our community, a vital dialogue with a depth psychology perspective. To get us started, I would like to introduce Dr. Leonie H. Madison, the president and CEO of Pacifica Graduate Institute, formerly chief operating officer of a community agency that provides education and support services for vulnerable Santa Barbara residents. Dr. Madison began her term as Pacifica's fourth president and its first black female in October of 2022. Dr. Madison has brought her extensive experience as a transformational people-first philosophy to increase the impact of Pacifica. She is working to ensure Pacifica becomes a world-class institution that improves lives of communities through collaboration among students, faculty, staff, and alumni. Since taking office, President Madison has focused on engaging diverse voices on and off campus in conversation about Pacifica's past, present, and our future. Beginning with her first 100-day listening tour, uh, Dr. Madison spent time in speaking with all of our constituents here at Pacifica. Based on this meaningful engagement and feedback from across the community, Dr. Madison has established three strategic imperatives for Pacifica moving forward. Elevate learner outcomes, empower organizational development, and expand Pacifica's impact. All of which we hope to contribute to with community events such as this one this evening. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Leonie Madison. Again, hello and good evening. It is my pleasure and privilege to welcome everyone in the room and those who are joining for the live stream. As part of our Mental Health Awareness Month, we're pleased to host tonight's dialogue on mental health in our community. It is wonderful to engage with many of you this evening in the room, and I'm looking forward to others who are on their way in. And it is such a delight to see your faces post-COVID. Beautiful to see your faces and to feel the energy. There's something special about coming together versus being online, not to put a damper into those who are joining us um, live stream. And it's also very meaningful to connect with community. We know that this work takes community. In my country, which is Jamaica, the West Indies, we often say no man is an island and no man stands alone. So thank you for being here with us tonight. And may this be one of many more meaningful gatherings to address this very important topic. So again, my name is Dr. Leon H. Madison, Dr. Lee for short. And as Dr. Rika made mention, I do have the privilege and the honor of being Pacifica Graduate Institute President and CEO. So for those who may not know, Pacifica Graduate Institute is almost 50 years old. And we are one of only a very few graduate institutes to prioritize education, research, and training in depth psychology which is a field of study that explores the unconscious and how healing with an individual or collective is associated with allowing what has been repressed, what has been rejected, denied, or ignored to come forward so that it can be better understood, its meaning explored, and integrated, allowing a transformation in consciousness. 
at Pacifica Graduate Institute, we offer master's and doctoral degrees from our two campuses in the Santa Barbara area. With tonight's event coming to us from our Lambert campus, our Lambert Road campus in Carpinteria. Pacifica's mission is centered around preparing the next generation of scholar practitioners and researchers to serve their communities through healing work. And in the larger sense, we believe in influencing the personal, cultural, and planetary concerns of our times. Many graduates work as therapists in clinics, healing centers, public mental health, or private practice. Here at Pacifica, I'm proud to share that we are truly committed to tending soul in and of the world. I'd like to also share with you my own personal journey with Pacifica Graduate Institute. I have felt transformation that can come from quality mental health care offered by a Pacifica graduate and the life-changing resources as a Santa Barbara County resident that has been made possible from organization just as the ones that are here this evening and we'll be hearing from. So my personal healing journey awakened my vocation, which is one of the reasons I stand before you this evening. The mental health challenges that I experienced occurred precisely because I had buried them to some extent abandoned and even scorned my life experience. And one, two, I'll share with you, I experienced a near-death stroke and was paralyzed on the right side of my body. I almost committed suicide. And so I know what it feels like to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And I also know what it feels like to be nurtured, cared for, listened to, understood by a depth therapist. And so turning away, my experience had kept me from true healing through abandoning and rejecting what was, what I'd experienced. And once I could look at and be with what we at Pacifica call the shadow in my life, it was only then I could truly start my healing journey. When I re recall, like it was yesterday, being in a safe space, almost like a container, the womb, safe. I remember what, what that felt like during my therapy. And in this safe space, I could see I could look at myself without scorning who I was. I got the courage to accept myself and love what is in the present moment. And it was only then I could transform, to, to transform my pain to what I call from pain to purpose. I experience how pain can serve as the fuel that moved me from the old Leone into the next chapter of the life that I truly believe I was created to live. And most importantly, I gained the tools to transform the sense of victimhood that I carried in my body into serving as an agent of transformation. I've experienced individually and collectively how suffering, pain, and discomfort can fuel creativity, mindfulness, compassion, curiosity, and growth. And I must share with you that while going through my personal transformation, it felt like I was going through a period of mourning. You have to understand that as a Black woman from the Caribbean, 
uh, speaking about your mental illness was scorned. You were shamed. And so to step away from my culture, I felt like I was betraying my culture seeking for help. I have experienced that and more during my healing journey. Something happened today. Earlier today, one of our celebrated core faculty members of Pacifica, Dr. Susan Rowland, offered a wonderful program about her work with fiery feminine eerism, explored through her latest detective novel, The Alchemy Fire Murder. Dr. Rowland's work has been described as Jungian arts-based research that places creativity at the heart of knowing and being. In doing so, her work promotes social justice, oriented transdisciplinary paradigm, while bringing back the almost forgotten, but never wholly abandoned practice of alchemy. Creativity is at the heart of knowing and being. So I get the sense that you must be asking yourselves, how does creativity at the heart of knowing and connecting, you might ask, add to our discussion tonight around strengthening and connecting mental health resources in our community? From my perspective, I believe quite beautifully. The qualities of curiosity and knowing distinguish Pacifica's Jungian-based approach to mental health. Dr. Rowland and Pacifica's work teaches practitioners how to use depth of presence with our souls as critical elements of the healing journey. Our expert alumni community and faculty do not attempt to fix anyone. Instead, we invite every human being to a more curious, it's like a, cu a journey of cu curiosity about being themselves, being who they're created to be. And so we invite every human being to be more curious about their healing and transformation journey. Another thing I will share is that Pacifica, we do not embrace a, any type of savior mentality. Instead, at Pacifica, we believe healing is truly possible. We enable everyone to be curious about their soul journey and in turn about one another's and our planets. Our difficult, even traumatic life events can be transformed. They can be transformed into experiences of gifts and the gifts that it's gifted us, a pathway to curiosity, the gift, an opportunity for humor. I heard that today during Dr. Rowland's um, program. And also a soul tending experience. So my question for all of us this evening is this. Can we listen long enough? to distinguish our soul's calling, the soul that's calling us to show up. Can we listen long enough to hear it? Can we hear the call in the middle of what Dr. Roland described as the fiery furnace, the fiery furnace of climate crisis, the fiery furnace of a mental health crisis, the fiery furnace of social justice and in the most difficult moments of our lives can we hear our souls calling so before i introduce our panel i invite those who are online and those in the room to take a moment to breathe with your eyes closed or open we can take five inhales and five exhale together. No words, no counting, no extreme in breaths or out breaths. Simply breathe at your regular pace, being 
and attune into one another. So I invite you to begin with me now. Thank you. From my experience, transformation occurs when we can shift our lives away from tragedy. Tragedy is when we no longer believe we have the power of choice available to us. So as you can see from our agenda, I hope you have one. Do you all have an agenda with you? Yes. Wonderful. We have pulled together some of Pacifica's faculty and practitioners we have several influential and dedicated partners, providers, and advocates from our local community who together make all of our efforts to address the mental health crisis possible through life-changing work in wellness and sanctuary centers, hospice, the youth, and the underrepresented. We thank all of you for being here today. We look forward to hearing your perspectives resources, and insight. We at Pacifica are honored to host such a distinguished group and this vital conversation tonight. So let me first start by thanking Diane Travis Stieg, our Senior Director of Alumni Relations, and Gemma, Ma Gemma Elliott and Matthew Bennett, co-chairs of our Counseling Psychology Department. Thank you all for the great work that you've done to put to put in this event together tonight. Thank you so much. And thank you all for showing up um, today. So with that, we will move on to the panel portion of this evening. So moderating our panel, we're grateful for Miss Dana Williams. So let me share a little bit about Dana. Dana is a licensed psychotherapist and the CEO of California Coastal Counseling. She has a private mental health care practice providing psychotherapeutic and behavioral health care services to adults, adolescents, and children across California. That's a huge job. Dana impressively and successfully balances careers as an actor, consultant, and producer in addition to her work as a licensed mental health care provider. Dana also co-created and co-hosts Real Psychology, a popular live on-camera podcast with a studio audience that explores the mental health of fictional characters in movies and TV and interviews celebrity guests to raise public awareness of mental health and destigmatize mental health treatment. Thank you for being our host tonight, Dana. We welcome you to Pacifica, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. It's such an honor to be here with you all today and with my colleagues. I'm very excited to um, embark on this conversation that we're going to be having um, to raise awareness around mental health issues, to help destigmatize uh, mental health treatment, and... Um, illuminate the many community resources that we have here in Santa Barbara. So I wanted to start by just having um, an introduction. In the recent years, there, the dialogue surrounding mental health has really gained momentum and attention. It shed light on the struggles that face individuals navigating emotional landscapes. It's a topic that transcends age, gender, race, social status, and it impacts us all in various ways. Mental health was once a subject relegated to the shadows and is now being courageously brought to the forefront of public discourse. By discussing it openly, we have an opportunity to challenge stigmas, amplify awareness, and foster a compassionate environment for those affected by mental health conditions. As we strive to reduce the barriers that prevent individuals from seeking help, it's essential to recognize the primary trends, 
concerns, and resources available in mental health care landscape. By delving into these topics, we can empower ourselves and others with knowledge, support, and understanding. I invite you to join us in exploring the multifaceted dimensions of mental health as we initiate a thought-provoking conversation that addresses pressing questions, shares experiences, and seeks ways to enhance the mental well-being of our community. We know that through our collective efforts, we can dismantle the stigma surrounding mental health, bolster resources, and contribute to building a community and a world that embraces and nurtures the minds and hearts of individuals across all walks of life. I'm very excited to be here with you, and I thank all of you and those of you joining us online for your time and your commitment to this important conversation. So without any further ado, I'm going to take a seat, and I would like to um, have us welcome our panel of very distinguished guests. I'd like to start with Matthew Bennett and have each of us just introduce ourselves um, and the community that you serve, the organizations that you represent, and then we will dive into our discussion. Hi there, everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Matthew Bennett, and uh, I am co-chair of the uh, Department of Counseling Psychology here at uh, Pacifica uh, with my co-chair, Gemma, who's sitting next to me. Uh, we have a master's degree and a doctoral program, a PsyD in Counseling Psychology. Uh, I am a licensed psychologist by trade, and my background is community mental health and inpatient settings. So I started off my career working with SMI, that's serious mental illness, in uh, locked psych units, psychiatric hospitals, mostly inpatient settings. And then I transitioned from that into community mental health. I worked for Ventura County Behavioral Health for several years. Ended up running older older adult mobile health, mobile mental health services for Ventura County before I came started to teach at, uh, at uh, Pacifica. And uh, we just launched our PsyD degree uh, couple years ago, we now have a first and second year, so we're excited about the direction our program is taking. Thanks for having me here. Hi, everyone. Good evening. And to those online as well, I'm Gemma Elliott, um, the other co-chair of the Counseling Psychology Department here at Pacifica. Um, I've been at Pacifica 10 and a half years this year, so it's gone by really quickly. Um, I'm also a duly licensed clinician, LMFT and LPCC in the state of California. And uh, a lot like Dr. Bennett, my, my clinical focus has been in community mental health. So um, I've been, uh, my training on forward in county granted, county granted and county mandated mental health in Los Angeles County for children and families that are mandated through DCFS um, and work with children and families um, on the lifelong spectrum of adoption. So I bring all of that to my work um, at Pacifica, really proud of the work we do. I'm seeing some of my students here in the uh, audience tonight that are graduating this week, we're so proud of them. But um, we'll share more about this tonight. But I think one of um, the hallmarks of our of our programs here at Pacific, as Dr. Lee shared, is our focus on rigorous clinical training and modeling what it means to be um, a, a culturally competent clinician. And so our students from day one are required, for example, to be in their own psychotherapy through the entire time that they're in the program to model and normalize that for for the the populations that they work with. So I'm thrilled to be with you tonight and look forward to the conversation. Um, my name is Ramona Winner. I'm the family advocate for the Santa Barbara Mental Wellness Center and the Santa Barbara County NAMI. And I work with families who um, are usually, they come to us in crises. I came to the mental wellness center myself about 18 years ago when my own son was recently diagnosed with a mental health disorder. And and it was just devastating to our family. We were in, we were a mess. We were just a mess and I didn't know anywhere to turn. Um, a primary care physician referred us to the mental wellness center. And there I worked with the family advocate then and this person helped me learn how to navigate the mental health system. And uh, we got some really good training through our local NAMI, uh, family to family class. And it gave us a chance to kind of breathe 
to breathe and um, kind of normalize my son's mental health disorder. And years passed, and when I had the opportunity to come back and work with families just as and help them just as I was helped, I jumped on the chance to do that. So uh, thank you for having us this evening. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Selberg, and I'm the CEO of Hospice of Santa Barbara. I've been at Hospice of Santa Barbara for the past nine years. Previous to that, I was the executive director of Pacific Pride Foundation. I worked there for 20 years and the last 10 years as the executive director. Um, and at Hospice of Santa Barbara, we're quite a unique program. We're the second oldest hospice in the United States, and we're a psychosocial model hospice. There's many good medical hospices that we work very closely with throughout South Santa Barbara County. Hospice of Santa Barbara, we help those that are uh, struggling and facing terminal and life-threatening illness and their loved ones supporting them, as well as those grieving the loss of a loved one. So that's our basic mission. And we've got a large program with over 23 therapists on our team providing counseling support services. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rachel Steidel. I'm the executive director of YouthWell. Um, I am also a mom of three daughters, uh, two 24-year-old twins, don't recommend it, um, and a 21-year-old. And um, my early years were doing clinical work, working with um, youth in group homes and also working with youth and adults around addiction. I then had a business here for 15 years doing resourcing for families in Santa Barbara County and beyond. And I share that because when my own daughter started struggling with her mental health in ninth grade, we couldn't get services around her. And it wasn't for lack of knowing how to ask for help or knowing what was needed but we just simply didn't have them. And so YouthWell was launched seven years ago as a way to bring together a collaborative of all of our organizations doing this kind of work and our school districts throughout the county and law enforcement to really just talk about what the issues are, how do we work more in collaboration, leverage resources, and make sure we're really addressing early intervention and prevention efforts so that youth are not having to wait till they're in crisis to get support. Hi, I'm Barry Shore, and I wanna thank the organizers because at my age, it's good to have your name on both sides so you can remember it. Uh, I've been the president and CEO of Sanctuary Center since 1983. That's 40 years. Uh, Sanctuary was founded in 1976. Um, and uh, we were founded based on treating adults with serious mental illness. Um, we have evolved as every good organization that serves the mentally ill needs to. Uh, we serve... Uh, not only adults, we serve older adults because uh, there's a lack of good services here for seniors. Uh, and three years ago, we began to serve children and adolescents uh, out of necessity. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But our philosophical approach to treatment is our teaching clients to become the masters of their illness instead of their illness being the master of their lives. I, I can't say I'm particularly religious, but I will say, God willing, someday we will find a cure. But in the meanwhile, we want them through an integrated care approach uh, to be able to become citizens who not only enjoy their lives, but give back to this community. Um, too many organizations treat the head and not the body. We treat the whole person. We, are, um, for seven years, have operated the only integrated care clinic between Los Angeles and San Francisco, that's co-located medical, dental, psychiatry, substance abuse, and mental health services. The way we also grow is we are a training ground for post-master's students and second year and third year postdoctoral students that come from all over Southern California to do a year to two years training with us. And of course, once we train them, we wanna keep them. Um, so we do our damnedest in this very expensive community to keep them. Uh, and that's another way that we continue to grow our knowledge. But three years ago, we were approached um, by a local hospital here, and we know which hospital that is because there's only one. Um, and they said, uh, our NICU doctors, and I think most of you know what the NICU is, uh, 
are dealing with patients who may have started at birth having uh, issues, or and those issues may have grown over time, and they can't get these kids into psychiatrists. And I said, what are you talking about? You're the 300-pound gorilla here. You can't get your patients into a psychiatrist? No. Right now in Santa Barbara, for anybody to get into a psychiatrist at, for instance, Sansom, 12 to 18 months. At the county, even worse, and many times it's it's a locum tenens telehealth psychiatrist whose language of English is second or third. Um, so we partnered with Cottage, uh, specifically the Groton House Clinic, which serves the NICU patients long term, with a superb organization that knew kids way better than we did, something called YouthWell. Oh, wait, she's right here. And, and with Children's Medical Clinic, uh, a 90-year-old uh, pediatric clinic in Santa Barbara, um, we are fortunate. We employ three psychiatrists, one of whom was working for us as an adult psychiatrist, but his training and expertise was, it was in child and adolescent psychiatry. And what we did was we said to the pediatricians at Cottage and the pediatricians at Children's Medical Clinic, we will work in collaboration with you. We will help you with your patients, and we will return those patients to you when we feel they're stable, and you can manage their treatment so that we don't clog up treating more people. Um, so we did. We offered the pediatric providers a choice of telephone consultation with a psychiatrist, telephone consultation with one of our therapists, or actual referral for treatment by our psychiatrist and, and, and therapist with the goal, again, of putting together a treatment plan, treating those individuals and their families, and, and then returning them back to the pediatricians. And we've been, we've been averaging between 250 and 300 patients a year. The biggest piece is if the pediatrician calls us, we get them into the psychiatrist within seven days. Not six months, not 12 months, not 18 months. The second piece is we get them into therapy, and we don't just treat the child or adolescent, we treat the family because it's a system and nobody knows better about systems than folks who work and teach and learn at Pacifica. Um, we continue to grow that program, but what we have learned about is this during this three-year process is that we have a crisis that is second to none. And the American Association of Pediatricians, the American Child Hospital Association, two years ago, stood up and declared, we have an emergency that we have never seen before in this country and in the world. And that is the impact of COVID on all of these children. And, and I feel so lucky personally that my kids grew up before that. But everything you think about that changed for these kids. And, and, and multiply it times 10 for kids who, who are in low-income minority families with no resources, sharing one bedroom or, or two bedroom places with three and four and five kids, and the lack of resources, the lack of ability to access their school counselors, their friends, the physical health services they needed, the mental health services. It, it, it is going to haunt our kids for decades to come. And and the little bit we do, we, we thank heavens we're able to do, but there is such a great need. And since we're talking about this community and the resources, we need so much more to take care of our kids in this community. So I'm sorry I rambled on, but it is heartbreaking. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi all, uh, my name is Jonathan Thompson II. I'm a licensed psychotherapist here locally. Um, I just love that we have this opportunity to all be here together in this space. Good to see everyone. I'm also the diversity director for Santa Barbara Camp, which is the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. I'm also a DEI committee member and just was elected to the state board. I'll be starting in a couple of weeks, June 1st. So very excited for that. Very excited to represent our community, very excited to represent our BIPOC and people of color, because that's an area in our community that has an opportunity for growth. 
Um, in my work, I work with children, adolescents, but also work with families, uh, helping children who have been impacted by trauma. I've also worked inside of the community health space as well. So working with clients and families there, and then also work in a private group practice, uh, helping children and families, including um, other populations, including those considered in the minority. We're not minorities, we're just considered there. So I just wanna empower uh, clients that I work with, empower people to see, and then also hopefully inspire other uh, black and clinicians of color to be a part of this community. So thank you for all that Pacifica does, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing a little bit um, with us about the organizations that you work at and the work that you do. We'll have more opportunities to talk about the services that you provide. Um, and we have some questions prepared for you. And first, uh, along the topic of COVID, wanted to ask the group and you can feel free to, you know, just sort of identify who wants to take the question or if multiple people want to take the question. But what are some of the long term Barry, you um, alluded to this a bit, but what are some of the long-term implications of COVID-19 pandemic on mental health that you're seeing in your organizations, in your practices, and how can we address the increased rates of anxiety, depression, other mental health conditions that are resulting from this global crisis here in Santa Barbara? Um, I think I did, yes. Uh at Hospice of Santa Barbara, we've seen very deep impacts uh, with uh, the pandemic, um, and we've we've especially seen them with um, the Latinx community and other such marginalized communities that didn't have equal access to resources um, in the community that include mental health services. Um, we uh, we have developed during the pandemic and after wait lists. Um, with our program, and that's pretty much across the board locally. Most counseling programs, whether they are insurance reimbursed or Medicare, Medi-Cal reimbursed or what have you, or they're freely provided like Hospice of Santa Santa Barbara, um, everyone's every organization is seeing wait lists, and we've seen um, that definitely. So that's that's a couple things. I would say that um, the, one of the biggest problems of the clients that we serve is they tend to isolate and over COVID, I mean, it wasn't anything to bring them out of their isolation. So <clears throat> the a transition out of COVID has been one of uh, anxiety and fear. Uh, and um, fortunately, we have maintained some of our programming. Uh, Zoom has been very instrumental in c keeping people connected, and we keep that op option open for those that are still anxious of of um, stopping the you know the mask wearing and the isolation. But that's the hardest part: is that um, we're trying to get individuals out of isolation, and for all these years, it was part of the norm. So I, I think that's probably the most difficult thing to address at this time. I'm trying to think of how to condense my comments because I could go on probably half an hour just about the impact we've seen in my work as a clinician, but I'll speak about in our, in our um, community here at Pacifica and training clinicians. Um, you know, as teachers who train clinicians, um, our students over the past couple of years imagine that we've had modalities for training clinicians for decades, and now we need to send student clinicians into a Zoom room. The first day they ever treat a client, they, they don't even get into the room with the client. We had to change our complete modality of what we know about psychotherapy overnight to show up in a completely different way, train our students in a completely different way, and equip them to do that. A hidden blessing was through the use of Zoom and other online platforms, we were suddenly able to reach underserved and underprivileged communities in a way we never would have because now the access was greater. We had a different access point. But what we're seeing now is the cumulative effect. So now that we're, I, I lose track, are we three years on? Each year, the cumulative effect of what we see in our students' mental health and our faculty and staff's mental health is exponenting year after year. 
because our clients are exponenting year after year. That ramps up the intensity. We're sending in student clinicians to face conditions that they've never seen before. You know, when I was a trainee many years ago, um, we weren't in these conditions. And so what our students are having to hold and face and then we holding and facing that as faculty supporting them, we're seeing um, the intensity of that. And so there's there's a piece for us of not just how do we support our clients as clinicians, how do we support our student clinicians doing this work and having to hold um, very intense um, work in the community and take care of them and themselves as well. So um, that's a challenge uh, to a level we haven't seen before. Uh, so I would I would just add to that that uh, w- one of the prevailing models of the expression of mental illness that's out there is what we call the diathesis stress model. That all of us have our kind of psychological San Andreas fault lines, you know, which usually are kind of invisible and kind of don't get triggered. But given the right set of circumstances, deprivations, isolation, uh, trauma, uh, it comes out and. Maybe one of the best examples of that is just with the onset of schizophrenia. You know, we see we see a bimodal age of onset of schizophrenia. Most people show symptoms either in their mid-teens or kind of the early 20s. And that happens, we think, one of the reasons that happens is because of the major life changes that are happening at that time. You know, you graduate high school, you go to college, you graduate college. And if you have an underlying diathesis that is a, t- a, p- a predisposition to schizophrenia or depression or anxiety disorder or whatever it is, you can fall off a cliff at that time. So if you assume that that's true and, you know, uh, ex- external stressors are associated with the outbreak of mental illness that might have been kind of hidden behind protective factors, add to that a global pandemic a, a global catastrophe which has changed the world and everything in it in the past three years. You know, I think those of us who are thinking about it knew we are not going to come out of this pandemic in the same shape that we were before. And we saw that at our program and we've seen it everywhere else. Like we are not coming back to the world we had. It is coming back in new ways. And if you have an underlying vulnerability for a serious mental illness, imagine the consequences of the entire world being turned upside down, you know, supply chains interrupted, disruption of services, lack of service personnel, major changes in everything from traffic patterns to employment to housing. Uh, it's, I think we're going to learn over the next few decades how, how catastrophic the impact has been under those of us who, number one, have an underlying diathesis for mental illness. And number two, don't have the protective factors that would otherwise kind of account for it. A, a question to that, and uh, also speaking to an issue that you raised, Gemma, um, how do you all feel on the panel that workplaces, schools um, can create mentally healthy environments for the students, for the faculty, for the employees? And what steps do you feel that organizations can take to promote um, employee well-being and prevent burnout, faculty well-being, student well-being? What are you seeing? What ideas, suggestions might you have for those that are on Zoom and for folks that are in the room on how to to help address this concern? So one thing I was going to add um, that I can tie into this question is that our youth are, you know, two years behind social in their classes. So we have third graders who went from preschool to third grade. We have kids from sixth grade who went straight into high school and didn't get a lot of those transition years of socialization. We are seeing and hearing from a lot of teachers from kindergarten through high school that the acting out has gotten really beyond anything they've ever seen because during the pandemic, a lot of... Um, Kids were sort of let, allowed to do whatever they wanted to do because everybody was so fearful of um, stepping in at that time. So kids were spending more time on devices. They were spending more time gaming. And so um, we recently hosted a workshop around setting boundaries. How do you help kids set boundaries who have now had two years of sort of anything goes just to get through this time? Um, and then uh, I knew I was going to forget this. 
Um, lastly, we at schools. Um, when I talk to youth, you know, we talk a lot about in our community about how important it is for youth to have trusted adults in their life. And what does it look like to be a trusted adult? And when you ask youth and you talk to them about their teachers, they will say, you know, teachers love to say I'm a trusted adult, but they don't do anything to model that in the classroom. The teachers that we believe in are the ones who, when we walk into the class, take the few minutes like you did to do a breathing exercise with us, to do a journal prompt. It only takes three to five minutes, but it makes us know this teacher believes in this. This teacher is someone I can go to. So doing more small um, practices within our schools, supporting staff the same way. I mean, I just came from a conference today that was focused on just the burnout factor because everybody is putting so much out there right now and the needs are so great. And so if we're also not taking care of the people doing this work, how do we um, expect them to keep going? And then the last thing I will just say is just I look at our college age kids and I have um, kids who are adulting right now. And so many of this generation think it's so neat that they can do this remote work. And I think it's fabulous at my age to be able to do it. I had all of the socializing and I know how to do this. But to see a 23 year old working on their bed when they are supposed to be around other people, they are supposed to be being mentored. They're supposed to be having those casual conversations, walking in and out of the office we have to be paying more attention to that because we the hybrid situation is great. There are so many wonderful things that we have learned from the pandemic. Um, telehealth has been another wonderful thing, but we still need to make sure that people are getting those opportunities to really be around others and learn from them. One of my concerns is that the world of Zoom has gotten out of hand. For us in the adult and the older adult population, 50% of the population we serve are homeless. They don't have access to Zoom. Um, and, and, and when the pandemic started, they went and hid further and further away from the center of town. And, and we had to, to travel out in, into the woods along the freeway to find our clients and bring them in. And they can't do Zoom. For our kids, when we started three years ago, 75% of the kids we've served are low income and, and minority. And we've never had enough resources here for the minority community. But when you ask a kid who's experiencing trauma to sit on Zoom in a one bedroom apartment with his mother and father who are maybe unemployed because of COVID, uh, and listen in, we, 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 we actually enhance and perpetuate the issues. When we started our, our child adolescent program, we expected to see a, a number of things. What we didn't expect to see is the level of trauma and the level of issues and the severity of the issues that we found. And we continue to find. And these are issues that will impact these kids I into adulthood. And the, the severity of them and, and losing their resources, not just their friends, but, their, but their, their teachers in school, their school counselors, and other resources that some of the mental health agents provide in the school setting. They had no access. They had nowhere to go. And, and families who had issues and became unemployed um, and were at home with their kids and took out their frustrations in ways we didn't expect to see on such a widespread level. We have so many hundreds and hundreds of kids in this community that are hurting and will continue to hurt. And, and we never once provided Zoom services to those kids and we never will. We want to give them a safe space, whether it was for psychiatry or therapy or family work. And, and it's a drop in the bucket of what this community needs. And, and we're working with one psychiatrist and, and the limits on what he can do and, and a cadre of about eight, nine therapists. 
uh, specifically to our child adolescent program. And it is, it doesn't begin to address the impact this community has experienced. And we'll continue to thank heavens, kids are back in school, but those issues go with them. And we all know that our schools are not funded enough to provide enough therapists and ancillary professionals to work with our kids in the school. We have a crisis in this country, but we have a crisis in this community. And, and what happens with every crisis in the community, it impacts the lowest income and the minorities the most. And if we don't stand up and do something about it soon, we will never dig out of this hole and we will never give our kids that we brought into this world what they need. Sorry. But... <laughs> yes. So, yeah, thank you. So parts of three school years were lost for children in our community, 2020, 2021, 2022. And there was gaps. People did not graduate. They didn't go to prom. They didn't go to kindergarten. They started in a Zoom box. So how is this going to impact them? We actually don't know because all of us are still dealing with it. And as much as maybe things have changed, how you feel, COVID's still there and the impacts are still following us. So what does that mean for some of the places in our community, for schools? It's looking beyond just the behavior. I think, as we know, behavior is just the iceberg, it's just the tip, but that's what gets people in for therapy, what gets them noticed. And that's not the real issue. It's asking that second level question. It's asking the why, what's really below, maybe what's going on in their family system, what's actually going on in their lives. I don't think we actually ask those questions enough so we can get a little bit deeper and figure out what's going on. And then related to what can we do in the work setting, I think as clinicians, we run into that compassion fatigue. We run into that stress that we see. So what are we doing to take care of ourselves first? It is the true oxygen mask idea, and we have to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves first. Parents who were teachers during COVID, uh, parents who had every other um, hat on as well as being with your kids 24 hours a day, now they're thankful for teachers in schools. So we have to make sure that we provide that space and treat every healing person with the ability to say, you are a healer, and give them a little time off. So as we look at ways even in our workplace and, at, and other places, Allowing people to be who they are, if they need to pick up their child at three o'clock, well, let them do that. Allowing some flexibility while also creating some routines and some things that are helpful for others. So I'm hopeful that workplaces don't take a one size fits all approach, but really looks at what each individual needs, what each family needs. And if that person needs to come in a little bit late because they need to drop off their child and pick up their child to allow that space to happen. It was perfect that you went first, Jonathan, because we were thinking the same thing. <laughs> and I was just going to, and I love that you named the parents because I work with kiddos too, so we focus, but our parents, I was one of those, all of a sudden I was a teacher on Zoom and working my full-time job and being a clinician and um, and all of that. But in my role at my job, I am a leader, right? I have to lead a large faculty and staff team of, I think, between 50 and 60 people. I have several hundred students. And I think what Jonathan said, I oft, I always tell myself, people over productivity, people over productivity. We need to stop in the workplace and really be attuned to our people. What is it that they need? And that means also pivoting, you know, the policies and the and the structures that we relied upon don't work very well anymore. We have to be able to quickly pivot and say, this isn't going to work anymore. I can't hold a student to this policy. That's not realistic. That's not realistic in the life that they're living right now. So I think we need to really slow down and get back to this mindset of people over productivity. And what do we need to shift both in our mindset, but also in the structures and in the policies um, and really listening to each other. You know, I appreciated Dr. Lee before you used that C word, curiosity. And I think in depth psychology, that's the center is to remain curious. The moment we think we know is the moment I worry about all of us. So, you know, I appreciate what you said, Jonathan. We won't know for many, many years what's really going to be true. We need to remain curious and present um, people over productivity. 
Um, we've heard from several folks on the panel just a few of the challenges that mental health care professionals face in providing effective and accessible treatment to diverse populations. The next question for the panel would be, what are some of the um, solutions or ideas that you have about how these challenges can be addressed in Santa Barbara, in our community? What are some of the things that have been effective in your organizations um, or needs that have been raised by the people that you serve? One of the issues we have in this community is a shortage of psychiatrists. And when I moved here almost 50 years ago, Cottage Hospital and County General Hospital, which doesn't exist anymore, had a uh, psychiatry residency program. And we turned down on average about six psychiatrists a year. And of course, they came to Santa Barbara to do their residency. And what happens when you come here? You never want to leave. So they all stayed. And they worked for County General. They went into private practice. They worked for the County Mental Health Department. When County General Hospital closed down, Cottage said they didn't want to do the residency program on their own. So they closed it. And at the same time, we had a lot of psychiatrists in their 50s and 60s. Uh, and you know what happens to them. They get older and older. And we be began to develop a shortage for psychiatrists. If any of you tried to access a psychiatrist in Santa Barbara at Sansom or the county or anywhere else, it is. It's six to 18 months to see them. And many of the psychiatrists who took Medi-Cal stopped taking Medi-Cal. Again, this is, it's a biased system. So right now in the South County of Santa Barbara, we have no psychiatrists that accept Medi-Cal. And the County Mental Health Department has quite a few telehealth psychiatrists who, again, English is their second or third language. A lot of them are not board certified, but they can't get them. And we all know why they can't get them because of the cost of living here. So we need to have a residency program again in this community. And, and uh, my agency, Sanctuary Centers, is looking at, in about two or three years, starting one. I don't know if we'll be able to do it, but we're looking at doing it. But we're looking at doing one that, that, that is, gets you board certified in psychiatry and gets you board certified in family medicine. So as we like to say, you treat the whole person, you reattach the head to the body. But we can't do it by ourselves. We're, we've been trying to convince Cottage to get back into that. But it's, it's horrible that we don't have that resource pre-COVID. And now with COVID, it's so much worse. And the same thing is true with therapists. You know, we, we had a tremendous abundance of, of wonderful marriage and family therapists in this community for many years. But employment opportunities started to, to dwindle and people stopped applying to become L LMFTs or uh, uh, now LPCCs or LCSWs. It seems to be gaining again, and, and we seem to be heading in the right direction with that, but we still have a statewide shortage of therapists and a statewide a shortage of therapists who want to work with the issues of severe mental illness, with trauma, with, and, and what is COVID in our kids? It's trauma, and, and, it, and trauma takes years and years to get past with these kids. So we need to have a, a community-based plan to address this, and, it, and, and who gets impacted the worst by this? The low income, the minorities in this community, because they lose their access to the Medi-Cal providers. They have to wait six to 12 to 18 months to get a telehealth psychiatrist through the county. The, more and more therapists start becoming worldly on insurance panels. We're not going to take Medi-Cal or we're just going to be private pay. Good for them, but bad for us. So we have a traumatic situation in our community. And if we don't all come together and figure out how to address it, and how to make this a community more affordable and attractive 
you take a psychiatrist that looks at living in L.A., comes up here to interview, and it happens all the time because we've done it in my agency. Well, they can buy more in L.A. than they can buy in Santa Barbara. And, and they look at, well, we're having kids. We're getting started with a family. We're going to get more down there. They turn around and they go back. So we have to do the things in so many ways to make this community able to attract the professionals that our kids need and the next generation of kids are going to need because it's not going to go away. I also sit on the board of directors for the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists as past president. And we look at the um, workforce as an association. We look at the new folks coming into licensure for all of the um, mental health care degrees. And I am seeing, we, we are seeing an increase in those numbers. So that is promising. But I think the pandemic did demonstrate that there is a significant shortage, not just in the state of California, but um, throughout the country. And I'm just so heartened that we have spaces like this because I do believe that this helps raise the visibility about the profession and the need um, when we can talk to students, not just at the college level, but in the high schools and even in elementary schools. And we're talking about potential careers to consider. All of that, I think, does help um, generate more people to come into the pipeline. And when I think people see themselves represented in their community, too, they're more likely to want to enter into the profession. So I really appreciate um, Pacifica and the you know representation that we see here. And I think there's even more opportunities for diversity beyond um, race uh, and gender uh, that we need to see elevated in order to help attract uh, more clinicians into the profession as well. Rachel, I know you had something you wanted to share. I just I agree with what Harry said. Excuse me, I'm getting over three weeks of bronchitis. Um, in addition, we don't have beds here for youth. So when we have a suicide attempt and a young person's put on a 5150, they are sent out of the county, which adds a whole other layer of trauma for that young person and their family and the siblings. And so figuring out how we get beds. Um, there's a lot of things that are not going to be fixed overnight, and there's a lot of things that require a lot of funding. But I also think there's a lot of things we can be doing every day in the work that we do. And I think it's important that we don't lose sight of that because there's, to me, sometimes the excuse of we don't have this, we don't have this. But what we all have the ability to do is stay educated on these issues. We all have the ability to show compassion I was speaking um, at the hospital a couple of years ago, and I had an ER nurse ask me what they could be doing better. And I said, I don't know anything about how you specifically work, but when a family comes in needing support, we need to treat it like it's their first time. So often I see families getting treated like a checklist item. It's like depression, you go here, you, you go here. It doesn't work that way. We need to listen. We need to actively listen to families and their unique stories and figure out how to get creative and think outside the box. Because we are not, as Barry said, we don't have enough therapists. We don't have enough psychiatrists. So what are some of the buffering services that we have available that we can wrap around young people? How do we continue to check in with families? How do we empower parents and youth with more tools to practice self-care and for parents to feel like they can support their kids? So I just think the more that we can um, focus on some of these things and in addition, be as transparent as possible on addressing some of the challenges and how we um, start to leverage those resources. One of the big issues, as Barry was talking about, is um, also paying people to be able to afford to live here. Uh, we're not paying people well enough for working in these organizations. So absolutely, they're going to want to start their own practices when they can do telehealth without a lot of overhead. I also see a lot of our organizations using associates who do need their clinical hours, but being thrown into situations to work with youth who have experienced a lot of trauma. And it's a unique experience to work with a young person and ask, being asked to run parenting groups. And I'm sorry, as a parent, I wouldn't want a 25 year old in there telling me what life looks like for me at home. So we need to be more thoughtful about how we're working with associates and giving them the tools and mentoring them up so they feel like they can be successful with the kids that they're working with and the families. Yep, 
I make stigma. I have worked in this community for almost 50 years. And every time we think how evolved we are in this community, you get hit with a dose of reality. When, when we started our child adolescent program with, with youth well and, and with, uh, children's medical clinic and cottage, we knew it was going to grow and we needed to find space. We've been fortunate. We own all of our properties, but we needed a new property. 16 times we went out and looked at office space to rent in our beautiful Santa Barbara. We offered to pay full rent, anything they wanted, deposits, whatever. 16 times we got told, usually by the real estate agent, not the owner of the property, sorry, but we don't want your kind in our building. Now keep in mind, this is for children and adolescents, not in the hospital, not not suicidal. These are children and adolescents like your kids living at home with their parent or parents needing urgent help. 15 out of 16, we got told, if you want to move your office space here for your administrative staff, we'd love to have you. But 16 times, we don't want you. So we had to finally look at buying another space. So discrimination and, and is alive and well in this beautiful community. And we have to break that or we will never get the help everyone and their kids need in this community when there's an attitude like that. And every agent said to me, don't shoot me, I'm just the messenger. On to another one of the questions. Did you want to, this is along the line of stigma, and I think it, that you'll definitely be able to answer it. Just opening it up to everyone. Um, in your experiences, what are some of the other common misconceptions or stigmas around mental health and mental health care that you're seeing? And then also offer, what do you think we can do together to challenge and dismantle those stigmas? Well, the last question f kind of feeds into this one and addresses stigma as well. And one of the things that we focus on in our master's and doctoral programs here at Pacifica in the counseling department, there's there are kind of two skill sets that are necessary for, for, for therapists and clinicians who are going to help with the seriously mentally ill. And they, they don't often co-occur. And bringing them together, I think, is one of the things that we try to focus on. One of the skill sets is just being... Uh, how to be attuned and thoughtful and sensitive and relational and curious and imaginative as as a clinician how how to be how to listen how to how to process uh, how to kind of develop what we might call like humanistic and humanitarian values in in, in a clinician uh, such that we we care and we are able to empathize and we allow ourselves to feel difficult things, which is important when you're working with the serious mental, seriously mentally ill. And the other skill set is just learning about serious mental illness and the, uh, the assessment and treatment of it, what kind of postures to adop adopt in it, uh, how, what kinds of frames to use, and also how to how to kind of differentiate and listen. To, to me, it's almost like a skill set of pattern recognition, just like, you know, we can we can easily tell from, even if it's a song we've never heard before, we can tell a country song from a from light jazz or from R&B. There are differences among the different types of mental illness, you know, the, the difference between schizoaffective disorder and schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and borderline personality, those are very, those are very important differences. And they, they have a different rhythm and they have a different melody and different things work with them. So what we try to do is to combine, uh, to, to, to combine our students' capacities to be thoughtful and attuned and sensitive and to be willing to be present to difficult realities with these really kind of hard, hardcore meat and potatoes clinical skills, which it takes to be effective with these kinds of, of uh, populations. Otherwise, 
students who are particularly well trained or attend you know pro- programs like ours that I think are uh, f- effective and teach the right kinds of things those students kind of graduate and go straight into a private practice or they don't they don't avail themselves or practice or develop their their skills to work with serious mental illness so uh, and that that feeds into the stigma as well doesn't it because uh, w- w- one of the best descriptions of serious one of the best descriptions of serious mental illness that I've heard was written by one of my favorite authors, Nancy McWilliams, who says that th- the seriously mentally ill have intrusive access to realities that the rest of us prefer to ignore. They have intrusive access to realities that the rest of us prefer to ignore. If you look at it that way, it suddenly isn't a disease. It isn't something that you have or don't have. It is something that is part of the human condition that all of us have access or potential access to. That, you know, those of us who are not seriously mentally ill, in a sense, have been able to kind of defend ourselves from those things and to kind of create a, create a pocket. And so for many of us, whether we're clinicians or not, there's almost this kind of like atavistic kind of unconscious kind of horror response to encountering that deeper stuff, that darkness that's associated with mental illness, that deep shame or that crushing depression or that gnawing kind of endless hopelessness, you know, the, or the aimlessness or the, the terrible anxiety that comes with it. We don't like to feel those things. And so we don't like to be vicariously traumatized by, 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 being, by being in the room with it. And so again, I think where we can help with that, especially in graduate programs, is to, is to find students, and I think we're good at that here, to find students who are warm and thoughtful and sensitive and attuned, and to give them those meat and potatoes skills, skill sets about how to assess and treat serious mental illness. And then where possible to encourage them to stay and to work at least for a while within, you know, agency settings and to work with the seriously mentally ill who, who tend to be economically disadvantaged and disadvantaged in other ways too. So those are my thoughts. I really appreciate what you're sharing. And thematically, I feel like there have been multiple um, folks on the panel that have talked about the importance of listening and attunement. And I think in the conversation of uh, destigmatizing mental health, even a person who is not uh, pursuing a career in therapy, um, uh, it could be a caregiver, it could be a parent, uh, a teacher, can employ good listening skills, attunement. And I think there may be people in the community that are on Zoom and that are looking for some resources um, where to start if they are not able to access a therapist. How can they be uh, a supportive presence and an ally for their loved one? So the, the next question that I wanted to ask for the panel is, in addition to listening, attunement, creating a safe space, being open um, and available. What are some other things that families can do or loved ones in supporting someone with mental health issues? What strategies do you find are helpful um, that they can employ? Um, we, we've heard some discussion around the lack of resources in having psychiatrists and and the availability of and affordability of a good therapist and um when you have this you know this um inability to access these resources what happens is the family takes up the slack i can't tell you how many families have um are kind of held hostage in their homes with someone that has a serious mental illness because they can't access resources or because the um, stigma keeps them from asking for help and they're trying to keep it in the family and trying to deal with it on their own. And until it comes to a crisis where there is um, harm being done or um, they're, they're the behavior is so outrageous that it's affecting the people outside of the home, meaning the neighbors, right? 
then um, they reach out for help. And by that time, it's like 10 years in the making of someone living with a mental health disorder in their family, and uh, nothing has changed, and it just becomes worse, and the person just deteriorates more and more. So resources is really important. Uh, Education, family education is important. And unfortunately, there is no respite for the caregiver. You know, uh, some of our family members have had strokes because they have uh, dealt with this for so long in the family that uh, as a caregiver, you you become exhausted. You and and self care is I know self care is really important, and we do encourage people self care to make self care a priority. But when you have all this going on in your family, it's hard to take care of yourself. So um, I would say that the mental wellness center and NAMI both have done really well in their efforts of education, whether it's in the schools or um, or in by providing support groups for families and education groups for families so that we can know a little bit more about what our loved ones are <clears throat> experiencing and how to best help them. But um, I think acceptance, we've acceptance has been a big key for a lot of our family members that there's not going to be a solution or or and if there is a solution it's not going to happen overnight so thank you just to tag on to that thank you um at hospice of santa barbara um, we provide counseling services to families um we have a program called pal parenting after loss where um, both uh, the children come in, the parents come in, and uh, we break them out into different groups at various times um, at Hospice of Santa Barbara, and, and they uh, work through uh, grief, through, through group effort. There's also um, a matter of work families. Um, we see a lot of uh, law enforcement at Hospice of Santa Barbara in our counseling program that have sustained years of um, trauma and grief as well as uh, uh, firefighters um, that who's, who consider their, their work colleagues their family as well. So making sure that our counselors are trauma-trained. Um, when I first came to hospice, we had a, a one of our counselors trauma-trained. Now we have eight, and it's a very specific, deep training. Um, and as Rachel said about um, the age of the counselor, um, when a police officer comes in in their uniform or um, or a firefighter, they want to know the person that they're sharing and, and opening themselves up to um, gets it. Otherwise, they won't stay. They won't come back. And we um, so we make a real intention in our program to make sure that our staff are deeply trained in the work we do. And we've been able to um, engage and have uh have students from Pacifica come where we're able to uh, train them. They get their hours, and sometimes we hire them as well, or they move on to other great work in the community and beyond. So, Okay. How do we break the stigma? If mental health is health, and we have to make sure that we approach it in the same way. So when we talk about and with children and families and how do we help it, it's to start to open up that door. It was mentioned uh, in the opening remarks uh, how being a person of color, being black, uh, how we don't have those conversations at home, how we don't talk about it, other communities of color, how we don't have these conversations. So how do we break down the stigma? How do we start this? Is actually having that conversation. Instead of labeling someone as, you know, quote, that's the crazy uncle, let's have that conversation that there's probably something deeper going on. There might be some trauma there might be some other things in their family and other things may be deep in your own family system that are secrets that we really don't want to address or talk about. So I would encourage ways that we can start to open up dialogue in that way, not just conversation between family members, which is important, but in the deeper conversation. We need as other people and other peoples to have these conversations. And sometimes we feel unable and unequipped, but the first part is just starting the conversation. It's just listening 
It's just opening up a space and a dialogue so people are able to share if and when they feel ready. But they need to know that if they do come to you and they say something, that you'll be a listening ear. So my hope is that inside the community, and especially in our communities here locally, we can start that. So that's my hope is one way that children, families, and our greater community at large can start that work. So wanted to share, I um, even in my own family, right, as an African-American woman, it's taking the opportunity to um, educate sometimes or to provide a different perspective about certain stigmatizing language. So I have a three-year-old, and uh, when there's certain behaviors, family members might try to use labels or use language like crazy around them, and it's reframing that and providing a different narrative and trying to encourage that even at her preschool and modeling um, modeling not shaming. I don't know how to, a better way to state that, but there's so much shaming that happens, and we, we instill that even at a very young age when we... Um, criticize or uh, label certain children's behavior. And so I think that's a, a very salient point. And thank you for sharing that. Rachel, did you want to speak to them too? I'm so glad you said that because I um, worked at the Mental Wellness Center to start a program on a lot of our high school campuses a few years ago. And one of the things that I loved working with youth was educating them on how, <clears throat> how to be able to step into conversation so often. And I think this happens to us as adults too. We see someone struggling, but they're not one of our close friends. It's maybe a coworker, someone we run into, and we think, oh, that's not our problem. They have somebody else. Mm -hmm. And um, I was so amazed working with these young people as they started to understand the importance of stepping in and um, just asking, are you okay? How can I support you? And teaching about how important it is for the words we use that when we talk about someone's mental illness that we make sure that it's a part of them it's not who they are and so when we say things like uh, you know he's bipolar versus he has bipolar those subtle shifts and for young people when they're getting di a diagnosis it feels like a life sentence and it's scary and so to be able to keep reminding them that this is just a piece of them i also just wanted to share too in terms of stigma We've talked a lot about marginalized communities, which is huge. And we also have a lot of families who have insurance and the ability to pay who also can't access resources. And I say that because that can be stigmatizing as well when we assume that, that uh, mental illness can't affect everybody. Um, it can. It doesn't discriminate. And we um, often have families that we're talking to who have tried to ask for help, tried to get support, only to be told your situation's not bad enough, you have insurance, you're fine, you should be able to find something out there. That's not the case. And so one of the things we need to be doing, like you talked about solutions, is pushing back against insurance companies, figuring out why people are not getting their services covered, why we are not doing the same for mental illness that we do for physical illness. Um, so, Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Then to, again, the conversation that Jonathan was having about mental health is health. And we all have health. We all have mental health. It's very important. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, steps that can be taken at the policy level. And if anybody on the panel would like to talk about um, how we can ensure that mental health care is mental health care is adequately funded and integrated into our health care systems and given the attention it deserves. And if there are any bills or um, legislators uh, advocacy efforts that you'd like to raise awareness about here while we have this public forum, because I do think that that's part of um, the access issue. Um, or the uh, Board of Supervisors, the County Board of Supervisors, to uh, get more funding so that instead of building more beds in the jail, that we have psychiatric facility or, or beds available for psychiatric care. A lot of the uh, individuals that are in jail uh, with the mental health disorder are incompetent to stand trial and they, uh, they languish in those jails until they're able to be placed somewhere or 
<clears throat> or assessed to see if there's um, if they can be competent and and uh, and go to court. So um, instead of expanding our jail here in Santa Barbara, uh, just like they did in North County in Santa Barbara, uh, we're hoping to divert those funds and get more psychiatric beds. The problem is, once again, our community, our, our um, lockdown facility, the psychiatric hospital in Santa Barbara, is, has 16 beds. And um, often when we go there, they only have maybe 10, 12 um, clients in, inside. And that's because there isn't enough staffing the mental health technicians and uh, mental health nursing, uh, they can't be, they can't afford to live here. And therefore, um, if someone gets ill, then they have to, it'll be lower staffing. And that means that they can't have as many uh, patients in, uh, hospitalized there. So that's been, um, that's been really wicked because anyone that is requiring a hold, a 5150 hold, or longer period of time are shipped out of the county. And so it's it's a problem and hopefully we can find a solution. Um, but yeah, it continues to be a problem of our community. It's a very localized. To just check in uh, with Diane in the back to see, we, we do wanna make sure that we allow time for Q and A with the audience and folks who are on Zoom and so Given the amount of time, I just want to get a sense of how many questions we think we might have. If so, I'll ask one final question to the panel, and then I'll open it up to the Q&A. Does that sound good? Okay, perfect. The, my, my final question is actually just going to be another opportunity to kind of recap either the resources that your agencies provide or some of your favorite resources in the community that folks can access. I'll start. Um, <laughs> Why not? <laughs> um, just to give you all time to, to think, um, I wanted to um, raise awareness for PEP, Santa Barbara PEP, um, focusing on maternal mental health and services to um, parents, caregivers um, suffering with postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, or just wanting to build community. Um, I was an active participant in PEP when I was pregnant with my daughter and through the pandemic, I, I, my daughter was born, uh, four months before everything shut down. And so to have that community, um, and that space and the talk about the anxiety that I was experiencing was just, um, invaluable. And it's a great resource for maternal mental health and for parents. Um, and also Casa Pacifica's wraparound program. Uh, it's a great program when we talk about family resources. I worked with Casa Pacifica as a family facilitator for a number of years in community mental health and the parent partner relationship um, that many of our parent partners um, are also members of NAMI and seek their support. It's just a wonderful resource for families. So the, the child, the parent, both get a... Um, a therapist or a support, a community support, and then there's also uh, a case manager sort of overseeing the care. That's a great resource. So I wholeheartedly agree with you. Oh, good. Um, uh, PEP, I think, is one of the most special um, ways parents can connect when they first have a child. And I, one of the things that we're doing right now at YouthWell is expanding support groups based on that model for parents of teens, because that's one of the things that comes up all the time is we had this great support when our kids were babies. We were all willing to be transparent and share the high and lows, but somehow when our kids get older, we can only show the perfect sides of our family now. And so how do we create these support groups where parents can come in, get support from each other, learn from each other, and leave with tools and ways to practice self-care? The other one you mentioned was uh, Cost Pacifica. The safety hotline that they host is also really significant. And that's for zero to 18. Actually, that's not true, zero to 21. And what makes them special as a local helpline is that they really do as much as they can to go in and assess the situation and not necessarily pull a child out of their home knowing that they have to be shipped out of the county if they're put on a 5150. So 
they really work with families to try to get resources around them. They serve our whole county. And when we talk about things that need to change, we need to be putting more funding into things like that. Um, YouthWell also hosts the only resource directory for our entire county for ages 0 to 25 and their families of all the resources from wellness to crisis so that to make it easier for parents, for counselors, um, those doing resource navigating to be able to access services in their county, in our county. And then we also have um, created this last year and again in collaboration with our partners, RAC cards that we've distributed about 80,000 in our schools. Um, everything from all of our helplines that we have, more importantly on the back, how do you make those calls? Because I've been on calls with youth when they're being shut down by helplines and being told why they aren't going to be able to help them. So helping parents and youth advocate, all of the cards are done in um, English and Spanish. We did another one on coordinated care. What do you do after a suicide attempt? So these are in our emergency room so that when a parent leaves the hospital with their child, they actually have steps that they can take and are encouraged to put together a team, encouraged to call their pediatrician, encouraged to reach out to their school counselor because it's so shaming and parents really want to um, keep it as private as possible when the right thing to do is pull a team around you. And then other resource cards just around tips on opening up conversations and really encouraging dialogue between parents and their kids. Okay, I'm going to go back a tiny bit about what we can do. Everybody's heard the expression, all politics is local. Well, politics is a big issue in this community. When Sheriff Brown, who sits on the Mental Health Services Act Oversight and Accountability Committee and is a major activist for mental health, unusual for an old sheriff, he raised millions and millions in state grants so that when they built the new jail in North County, they would have a treatment center on that campus because there are I can't even tell you how many hundred folks with mental health and substance abuse are sitting in that jail. And many of you may know the largest mental health facility in the United States is the L.A. Twin Towers Jail. They house more mentally ill than any place else in the country. So he raised millions. He had to go back to the Board of Supervisors and ask for three or four million because they needed a match. The Board of Supervisors said, no, give the money back to the state. So we have a new jail up in North County, but we have no mental health treatment facility. My agency works in the county jail in South County here. They have a recidivism rate of 99%. Why? Because they want three hots and a cot. And we don't have the resources to do that in the community. So they reoffend over and over again so that they have a bed and food. We look at the Board of Supervisors here, and they're very nice people who have great hearts and do wonderful things, but the general fund in this county gives the lowest match to county behavioral wellness or the county mental health department of any county in the state. Get your money someplace else so we don't have the resources. We have to get our politicians to do the right thing. Mental health is not a popular topic with our Board of Supervisors. It's not a priority. And we have to make it a priority. So again, all politics is local. I could go on and on all the things. We used to have a child adolescent program. We had a geriatric psych program at St. Francis Hospital. It was phenomenal. When Cottage subsumed St. Francis, they did away with that. And nobody ever opened when, again, we lobbied and lobbied and lobbied. We have treatment programs in, in uh, two of the low-income uh, housing programs in Santa Barbara, Garden Court and Gardens on Hope. Fifty percent of the folks that live there have mental health and substance abuse issues. But worse yet, if they need treatment, there's no facility to treat them because they're too old. And what's an even more interesting fact is if you look at all the wonderful, expensive retirement communities there are in this community, there's one not far from here, uh, that, that none of them will take a senior if their primary issue is mental illness. None of them. The one, the one in Montecito that costs millions of dollars to live in. If you put down that your primary issue is, is severe depression, or 
or bipolar or something, they won't take you. Now, if you go in there and, and your primary issue is a bad hip, and then you develop depression, they can't kick you out. But we don't have the resources for, for no income, for low income, for middle income. We don't even have the resources for the rich who have mental health and need a place, mental illness and need a place to go. Again, all politics is local. We elect them. We damn well ought to hold them accountable at each and every meeting. So uh, one local place uh, here, nonprofit, is Calm. They work with children and families. They do excellent work inside the community. So I'd say that's one resource we can use. And one thing that I'll just add as a resource is for all the MFTs out there to join camp to become a part of the community, to be a part of the work. As a person who's a diversity director, we need more clinicians. We need more clinicians of color. We need more clinicians of different backgrounds to be a part of this work. So we need you. Um, if you're not a part, come find me, and let's make sure that we do this work together. Um. If um, the question being um, resources, um, CALM is an amazing resource in our community. There's so many good counseling programs. Um, if you know of anyone that's struggling with grief or um, is actively uh, been diagnosed with uh, terminal life-threatening illness and needing emotional support and, and uh, more, reach out to Hospice of Santa Barbara. And I encourage people um, if if our intake team says it's three weeks to get in to see one of our counselors, get do the intake, get on the list, and sometimes it can be quicker than that, um, and and uh, we'll see you. So, Hospice of Santa Barbara. Thank you, David. Um, several of our family members have uh, been referred to hospice uh, also because, as we know mental illness sometimes could get so severe that uh, people will take their lives or um, addiction um, with all the addiction problems that we have or we sometimes lose our family members and it's a beautiful place that you you can provide that service for us. Uh, the Mental Wellness Center um, is probably the most important mission is education. We have uh, mental health matters in the schools. Uh, ninth graders and sixth graders uh, get mental health matters a curriculum, uh, and that's connected to their health classes. And uh, we cover a lot of schools here in Santa Barbara School District and up into um, Santa Maria. So we've been successful in providing that type of education for children. Also, we have the uh, mental health first aid and youth mental health first aid and teen mental health first aid, which uh, we offer to educators in the public, um, anyone who is interested in learning more about uh, mental health. Uh, they're welcome to take our classes. Usually, uh, they're provided for free. Uh, sometimes uh, it's it'll be in person, and other times it'll be virtual. We offer many support groups, and we're trying to bring people into the center uh, so that they can um, get out of this social isolation, like, like I was saying earlier. We have a wonderful recovery learning center downstairs for individuals that live with a mental health disorder, trying to connect them to um, resources there, and also uh, any kind of like a a place where that they can gather and be safe and um, uh, with opportunities to explore music or poetry or other, other things, and we provide them free lunch. So all around, I would just say that um, we have uh, bilingual programming now. We have some wonderful new staff that can uh, help us try to break into the Latino community, because as it has been said here, it is an underserved community, and uh, they, they need a lot of help. So thank you. 
I think for us here at Pacifica, especially in the clinically focused programs, our goal is to remain connected to all of you. So this evening, this has been really meaningful to hear some of you reflect about the work our students do in your organizations. And so, you know, our goal is always to remain deeply attuned to the community and what are the needs that gets reflected actively in our curriculum. Um, David, I appreciated you mentioning trauma. So, you know, we've adapted our curriculum to be focused on um, classes on trauma and attachment and things that have really current needs to make sure that our students have the skills to meet those community needs. So I want to reaffirm that commitment for our connection there. Um, And I appreciate what Dana and others have said too about CAMP and about our advocacy from a professional perspective so that we can support students coming into the profession to be able to earn a livable wage and to have professional opportunities so that they can remain um, in community work. It's it's very challenging in those ways. So I think those are ways that we'll continue to to partner and and support those relationships. Uh, Just a a couple of quick policy recommendations, if if I may. Uh, Again, speaking as a psychologist, One of them would be an an almost kind of instant solution to the shortage of psychiatrists would be prescription privileges for psychologists. Uh, Several states already allow prescription privileges for psychologists. Federally employed psychologists, like in the military, already have prescription uh, privileges. Guess Guess who's the biggest obstacle to this being implemented in state legislatures? The American Psych... The American Psychiatric Association and the American Medical Association have prevented this from happening for, for a couple decades now. Uh, we could do it. Number two, uh, departments of psychology and, and uh, state and county hospitals. My understanding is I used to work for Ventura County, VCMC, Ventura County Medical Center. One of the few county-run hospitals in the state that have a department of psychology. Uh, it seems like a Seems like a small thing, but an important one. Uh, and integrate professional psychology uh, and psychologists, especially, who are really good frontline clinicians. Vent- Ventura County deployed psychologists very successfully. I was one of them. The very first person you'd see when you come in off the street is a psychologist. And, you know, psychologists are trained to be really good at kind of rapid fire, disentangling very complex clinical cases. And uh, I, I appreciate the contributions of my colleagues who are LCSWs and MFTs, but, uh, and, uh, yeah, the, the psychologists have a lot to offer, especially in agency settings. Thank you. So we have about five minutes or so to go to Q and a, uh, Diane, are there any questions that you all wanted to ask the panel from the zoom? Yeah. We have a few questions here. So the first one is, is there anyone working with mental health at the local boys and girls clubs? I don't think there's, they are offering services necessarily in in the local boys and girls clubs, but I do know with Boys and Girls Club, Girls Inc., a lot of our after school type programs are doing a lot more to get trained so sta- a lot of their staff are getting trained in things like youth mental health first aid, which Ramona mentioned, um, and they're doing more to work with community agencies and realizing that there's a real issue with a lot of their kids that they're working with. Great. Thank you. Another question here is, has Pacifica ever considered opening a local clinic site that provides care from a depth perspective? We've been trying for how many years? We've been asking and asking and asking. There's 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 some barriers to that, but absolutely, I think it's something that we've been wanting and asking for and and um, looking at for a very very long time. You know, our students come from around the state, around the world, and the Santa Barbara community. So, um, but it's absolutely something that we've been talking about as a community for a very long time. Is there more you want to say about that? Yeah, it's it's a it's it's a good idea. Where's where's one of the barriers, frankly, is the fact that our students we we because of our residential model, we take students all over the country. So uh, we have students who live in Maine and Oklahoma and Florida, and you know it's it's harder to kind of integrate them them into the local landscape. But we could also get them involved in like clerkships and assessment. Again, another thing I'd like to talk about 
in the future maybe is the role of assessment, psychological testing and assessment, getting good diagnoses, getting good conceptualization starts the treatment planning off in the right direction. And uh, sure, I would I would love to see Pacifica take a role in that. Thank you. Can I add something? Go ahead, please. Can I just add something to that? I, If you go in the Wayback Machine, uh, the three gentlemen who founded Pacifica, uh, who were good friends of mine 112 years ago, um, they had a nonprofit agency called the Family Education and Counseling Center that was one of the best this community has ever seen. And, and I would wholeheartedly support however I could or my agency could you accomplishing that goal of having a community-based clinic again. Addressing the issue of resources and addressing the shortage of uh, trained professionals is seems daunting. So this may seem um, somewhat of a radical suggestion, but I, 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 I feel that there is a uh, longing to break or at least disenchant momentarily the spell of specialty care, the specialty care mindset concerning mental health. And that is to say, to create a couple of things that maybe are not as uh, professional, but add some value. And is it possible that we could create a core of local uh, community health workers that are at various levels of, of psychological training and education uh, that, would, that would help uh, in a psycho, physical, social way of interventions that would help psychiatrists and MFTs and others. So, uh, and they could be bound by a common vision uh, framework. And the second non-professional um, kind of way of maybe helping is what Ms. Win uh, Winner mentioned about, is it possible we could partner with uh, many people in the arts I've worked for 20 years uh, in uh, professional organizations, and I saw much healing done through the uh, performing arts, through the fine arts, through uh, uh, bodily kinesthetic uh, uh, work, through visual work. And I'm just wondering if those are perhaps lower level, but potentially productive ways of augmenting the limited number of resources or uh, professionals uh, at the highest level. If, if I, I'll respond to the first part of your question um, or comment. The, the state of California, through the BBS, the Board of Behavioral Sciences, uh, along with, with the State Association of LCSWs, CAMFT and AMF, the American Association of Marriage and Family Therapy, lobbied the board many years ago to create a stipend program for, for a folks going for their MSW or going to, to become MFTs to get stipends to help them pay to go to school and become therapists. Unfortunately, part of that program went away a couple of years ago, and that was the stipend program for, for future MFTs. The one for LCSWs is still there, but not for MFTs. So almost all politics is local, but this needs to go back to the BBS and the state to reestablish that program to, for MFTs. And that where I was with a recipient of those stipends years ago. And I that's um, very disappointing to hear that it's gone for MFTs. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I don't think that I have the universal answer to your second question, but um, I do think it's an excellent idea. I, I, I do think that there's a lot of opportunity there personally. Um, it's one of the reasons why I co-created the podcast that I have, Real Psychology, um, with a filmmaker. It's um, an opportunity for us to share. I feel like I'm very loud right now. Um, for us to share, um, raise awareness around mental health issues and treatment and access and have conversation because it is a live podcast on camera with a live studio audience. So we interact with you know, the hundreds or thousands of people that are um, listening in live and then people can listen to a recording. Um, and I do think that a lot of people, we didn't get to this technology question that I had, but I do see for better or for worse, um, 
a lot of people using the creative arts um, online through Instagram to raise, um, to provide resources, I think, and also to provide information around um, interventions. And I wish that more clinicians weren't as afraid to do it. I oftentimes get nervous. I, I wasn't on Instagram forever until about a year ago at the urging of my colleagues and I, I still keep a pretty low profile apart from the the podcast. But I do think that there are avenues like that. And then, of course, locally, perhaps more um, the ideas that you were suggesting could be integrated. But I think that it's a it's a nice way, sort of um, a less intimidating way for people that might be apprehensive to talk to a therapist or to talk to people about the issues that they're having to to use sort of the creative arts as a gateway. So thank you for bringing that up. That is our time for today. Um, I don't know if you, Dr. Lee, would like to come up and say any closing remarks. If not, I'm happy to do it. Okay. All right. Well, um, I just wanted to thank Pacifica and the Alumni Association for putting together this incredible panel and this opportunity to have this important conversation. Thank you so much for your introduction, Dr. Lee, and for um, all of the panelists for making the time today and the work that you do to serve um, the community. And thank you all for being here and those of you for joining us online. Yeah, that's one good thing.